Thank you. Well, then I guess uh, what we decided to do was we're each going to do about 15 minutes of sort of our journey through writing, and then we'll do Q&A. Okay. All right. And I'm going to start because I'm the, um, what's the word? <sighs> Christina and I were in classes together here. And I have to tell you, I showed up to get a PhD, wasn't really sure what I was doing exactly. And I would read the big books we had to read every week. And I'd come in thinking, I really understood this book. I'm smart. And I'm smart. Like women should always stand up and admit how smart they are. And then she would talk talking, and I'd be like, oh my god, I will never be that smart. I do not know how she does this. So I was really excited when she said, hey, I was going to do this thing, and do you want to come? I was like, of course, I would love to hang out with Christine. So yeah, so we each do about 15 minutes. So uh, Roseanne Welch, she just kind of got the whole thing. Before we start, I did want to do a, a land acknowledgment. We do these a lot. I actually learned to do this at a conference in New Zealand. They were doing it far before we ever were. And interesting to me, when I was here, um, I was paid to do some paid research uh, for the Tongva group. And so it turns out to be one of the things that gets most read in my academia list. I keep going, wow, that's like 20 years old. But it was history of the area and, and the peoples. And I actually was able to meet with a gentleman who was the great grandson of a woman who had spoken with early sociologists and given them some of her language and found in some, you know, the lovely research that you get to do, some little microfiche somewhere, his great grandmother's Tongva name, which he never knew but she'd given it to that person and whoever thought to look it up, right? So it was really exciting. So it's wonderful to respect that they were here before us and hopefully we keep in mind their work as we work. Uh, so yes, we just did all the what I've done before. I was uh, in the middle of doing all that stuff when I wrote this encyclopedia of women in aviation and space uh, just because I saw an ad looking for book ideas uh, online at that point. And I wanted to do something on women who are astronauts. And they said, well, there aren't enough. What if you did women in aviation? And I thought, oh, OK, let me see how that works. And I read 200 biographies and books and whatnot. And, um, and I was really excited. But then the press, this was ABC Clio at the time, uh, who sold to libraries and whatnot. They said, you know, we'd prefer our writers have PhDs. And that's when I thought, oh, heavens to Betsy's. I guess if I want to keep writing things, I better go and do that, which is why I came here. Um, so this all happened kind of around the time I was doing that. Right now I do teach for Stevens College, which is actually located in uh, Columbia, Missouri. But we have a low residency program that brings students to Los Angeles, and we teach at the Jim Henson Studios, hence the Muppet, <laughs> in a Charlie Chaplin outfit, because this was Chaplin's original studio, uh, purchased by the Hensons in like the 80s. So we bring students there, we do screenwriting classes and that sort of thing. So that's kind of what I'm doing with my PhD right now, um, as well as writing a lot of stuff. Because I always wanted to be a writer. Um, it didn't really matter what. TV happened to be a thing that I started to do, and it was great. Um, but you don't always have final control of things. There's a lot of other fingers in the pie, and that started to get annoying, especially when you're thinking about representation of women and people who haven't been well represented in film and television. So having a say in this world was something that I enjoyed more. Uh, so ah, 2009, we just said that. So I, I'm on the boards of these different groups. I have a monthly column in Script Magazine that's about these women, basically. I took these women and I do a monthly column on women we haven't talked about, just to get more association out there. People just still don't know names like Anita Luce, who wrote Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which is brilliant and has never gone out of print, whereas The Great Gatsby, of course, was a failure when it first was published. And they only, it only became famous because they sent leftover copies to all the soldiers in World War I, and they came home thinking it was the best thing they ever read. Yeah. But we don't teach Anita Luce in our history, in our literature classes. We teach The Great Gatsby. We don't do the female voice. We do the male voice, which is always interesting to me. So I love to write about, obviously, this kind of stuff. So let's get started and how people get started. You have to build a track record. And you can't always jump right into something academic because they're like, oh, what have you done before? What are your writing samples? So for me, um, at around the same time I was working on this, I, was, I would write op-eds for the uh, LA Times. And even, I'm from Cleveland originally, I would send stuff to the Cleveland Plain Dealer if it was a particular bent that suited them, right? In this case, these were things that suited me. I used what was my expertise, which in this case, talking about movies and how I thought they were either misreviewed in some way or needed to be looked at through different eyes, um, and I would get published. So now I have a little, you gotta build that little, what are all my publications? In a newspaper, of course, they don't pay you. None of these groups 
mostly pay you that much. Um, it's again about getting your voice out there, which works for me. So one of the things you can do is start looking into local newspapers, newspapers from whatever your hometown may be. Doesn't have to be here. That's always interesting. Um, but it's a place to begin to build your thing. Then you'll find online a lot of calls for submissions for chapters or essays in other people's books. And again, if you have a particular expertise or bent that you can sell them, they'll offer that to you. So as you can see, I'm a fan of Doctor Who, <laughs> uh, the longest running, whoops, longest running science fiction show in the history of television. It's an English show. Um, they just did uh, two seasons where for the first time the Time Lord became a woman and that was fascinating and brilliant to me. And this person I met at a conference like 10 years ago wrote to me and said, I'm, I'm doing this book. Can you do a chapter on how hard it is to write for a female who's the hero character now? And I, I thought, well, there you go. Other people wrote about different things, different representations in the show, but I had become the expert in what it is like to screenwrite for certain characters. So that was beautiful. These are adorable little books, uh, very culty, all about different things. Um, Boldly goes as, of course, Star Trek, regenerates as Doctor Who takes a stab as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So they come to me and they're like, can you give us an essay on this show from your perspective? So again, not, nobody pays me for that. And likewise, these are two books on film um, that I looked at women in films in these eras. So you can find, they're always asking, right? So it's, it's good to be looking. Who's, who's got a call for submissions? You can look for trade magazines before you definitely jump right into full academia. So trade magazines are always looking for new ideas. Um, in this case, of course, as I said, written by a magazine. This is the first place I came up with this. Um, I just decided to look into the men and women who wrote that show in the 1960s. They were a good chunk of them still alive in their 80s and were telling me about being hippies in the 60s and who was getting high on the set and who wasn't. Um, but what was the business of writing the show, which won an Emmy in its first year? Right? So people don't think that. They just know they were a rock and roll band eventually. Um, but the nice thing is, wrote an article for them, used that as the proposal for the company to get the book deal, and then a few years later, this, um, reprint, this, this magazine series came, three pieces, and the woman had seen this article in this magazine and called to ask if she could reprint it. Right, so then suddenly I was published in her piece. So you gotta get your word out there and people will find you, right? So that was always very fun. So trade magazines, what might be your specialty? And of course it's either the thing you're studying now or something you studied before you came here. What was your job before you decided to get a PhD, right? We all have, sometimes have lives before. Um, Again, in journals, right? So right now I'm the book review editor for the Journal of Screenwriting, so we're always desperate for people to do book reviews. You get a free book, and then you get published in a journal. So whatever, again, is your specialty. The first time I did a book review, it was for a feminist journal that somebody here at CGU was editing, and so I did a review for them. So now I could say, look, I'm, <laughs> maybe it was, yeah? There you go. So, so then I had a track record in doing book reviews for journals, and by the time I was done, uh, I had, uh, published a couple of articles here, and then they said, hey, do you want to be the book review editor? I said, oh, okay. All right, so then this is great for me and my graduate students because it gets them, a, so I ask them first, are you interested in any of these books? And then they get a publication. So look into what you're good at. Obviously, California history. Um, they came to me because they found me here, and they wanted someone who was a popular culture historian to add to their board. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so journals are a great place to look, and they do want both articles. So the things you're writing for classes, of course, are something that could suit them, right? And just there's such a plethora of journals out there that you can look through. Um, you can get started writing entries in encyclopedias. They're always creating new encyclopedias. Uh, this, again, I wrote everything in this book. I didn't know you could ask other people to write entries for you. <laughs> I just thought they hired me to write a book. I better, like, fill it up. Uh, but because I... Went to this place uh, a few years later, almost 10 years later. Um, I have a friend that I work with at Cal Poly Pomona. I also teach there uh, sometimes. And um, she had an idea for a book. And I said, oh, well, I know an editor at this place. Let's see if he's interested in your proposal. He wasn't. But he said, hey, we're working on a new encyclopedia. And it looks like you and your friend would be excellent editors of one on women in American history and popular culture. And I said, OK, we'll do that. And that was putting out uh, submissions. We want people to write entries on many different people. And Christine so kindly, I knew she was a specialist in her. I said, can you, because how else would the sisters have gotten into an encyclopedia? 
They wouldn't. They wouldn't. <laughs> Nobody would know. So this way they get more airing and then people find her book. And you. So, so obviously we're always looking for that. And for that you'd go to a different publishing company and see they have newsletters and they'll ask, hey, we're looking for people who want to do an inside, you know, entries in this type of thing, that type of thing. Um, a couple years after we did this, they came to us and they'd hired someone to do technical innovation in American history. That it was... It was um, a dude, like dudes, married to a dude, have a son who's a dude, okay? But um, they dropped out. And so they said, would you guys like to finish this project for us? And we took it on. When you do an encyclopedia, you decide who's going to be in it. You pick the whole listing of who's going to have entries. We looked at this entry, this list. There were no innovations, no technology created by women, no technology created for women. Like, I want to know who invented the washing machine. That's useful to women, but nobody thinks that's important, right? He had all the dude stuff. So we took it over knowing that we could add our touch to it, which made us happy. And then actually what we did with this is we were teaching some classes at Cal Poly that were based in STEM, and we had our students write the, in the entries as part of their classwork. And then they got published, which was really fun, obviously, and saved us some time. So encyclopedia is always looking for that. Um, so that's a good place to start. You should go to conferences. All right, whatever is, again, your specialty. But there's a lot of variations of what your specialties are. I was having a conversation with a friend who now teaches at Tennessee. He was my, uh, on my, dis uh, my, yeah, my dissertation here. He was the third visiting scholar who was on my uh, committee. And now he teaches in Tennessee. But we were big fans of Doctor Who. Torchwood was the spinoff of Doctor Who. Um, we were having an argument about an episode. And he said, you know, this debate would make a good article. Let's do it. And as we started thinking, where would we put it, there wasn't any place yet. And then he stumbled on a conference. We had to go to Wales. I was like, well, I'm not going to say no to that. I got, I got a trip to Stonehenge out of it. Um, we presented at the conference. And then the conference people said, oh, we're going to do a book of the, the most important pieces that got said here. And ta-da, suddenly we had another chapter in a book just because we went to the conference. Same thing, although I'd done this in the magazine, um, I've then presented on the monkeys at several different types of popular culture. Yeah, and if you know who they are, I had gone to their concerts, and they had a 50th anniversary special for um, their show, it's 50 years, um, and, and handed them each a copy of the book, and they were so excited. So yeah, so you get a lot of like stuff happens out of that. That's yeah, really cool. Um, so think about going to conferences. Certainly try ones you can drive to, because, you know, cheaper, but then some Sometimes maybe it is a place you have to fly to because it's just going to be special and you're going to meet really good people. All right, the people you meet, so much has come from that. You're probably going to have friends who teach at other schools, even here. If you have an expertise in something, you can offer to do a lecture on that thing, which is kind of the seeds, the beginnings of putting together an article. So in this case, I do a lecture on the whole adaptation world of A Star is Born and go through the process of what, how it changed for women across time and how feminism is represented in each of those versions of the movie. I do that for a friend at USC. She comes to me and does a lecture on Mabel Norman, who was a, a silent film actress who people forget, who was as popular as Charlie Chaplin, but died young, so falls out of the history books. So we swap out, right? And for that, I'm now doing a chapter on this in another book. Um, all right, so what's important is you start a relationship with an editor, and they like you, so they offer you more things. So as I said, did this, he offered us that. In the middle, I did this with a friend. I just like to leave it there because it's fun. It's a bunch of um, essays we collected. That was a feminist press. Didn't get a lot of publicity, so I still have copies at home. <laughs> but it was fun to do, uh, and it was something that meant something to my friend and I, in parenting and managing your marriage and stuff like that. It was useful. Um, they will lead to more work. So, right, then he offers us this. Then he came to us and said, we're doing a series of books on how history has been uh, portrayed in film. And since my partner is a Civil War expert, he was like, hey, you guys should write the Civil War book. And since I do American women, he's like, oh, you should do that book. Um, so we said yes, because we were interested in those topics. And as I said before, we each we picked 10 movies that we thought illustrated what we wanted to say. And we go through and explain what's true in the movie and what was made up for drama, what the real history was. So we got a chance to be historians, but popular culture historians um, all at the same time, and make sure we picked movies that were heavy on female characters, which wasn't going to happen with somebody else doing those. But that all came from one editor, and then he left. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a new editor who's equally nice. Um, 
don't stick to one publisher. This was someplace else. A, a, an encyclopedia company is not going to do this book. So when I wanted to do it, I had to go elsewhere. It's McFarland Publishing, who also then did this book. Um, so what happened was once they liked this, and I recommended this was my first class of MFA students. They'll have to write research papers on these various women. And at the end of the first cohort we had, um, the papers were so good, I called the editor who'd done this and said, could I sell you a book on women in early Hollywood? And they're like, oh, sure. So then all my first students got published because they said yes, but because I had a relationship with the editors at this other company. So you have to think about that. Uh, too fast, sorry. Um, okay, once you get known, people start calling you and, and asking you, hey, would you do a piece in this? So I had a friend who was doing this journal uh, and it was on, it was on a cop shows. And I thought to myself, I don't have anything to say about cop shows and culture. They all seem the same to me. And then when I was mulling it over, because I wanted it to be in his book, <laughs> I was like, what am I doing wrong? And I suddenly realized, oh, but what I can tell you from watching cop shows across cultures, so an Italian one, an English one, and one in the United States, is that it's not the cops. Their lives are all the same. They all do the same forensic stuff. That's boring. It's when you see their parent characters that we hear what their culture is like. Because their parents either like or dislike their, their job, et cetera, et cetera, want them to get married, whatever it is. So I realized I do have something to say about what culture we see in cop shows. And I suddenly did that. And then likewise also um, here doing a piece on um, women in, history, in the history of screenwriting. So you get asked to do stuff like that. Got asked to do the column I mentioned the other day. And upcoming I have a piece because in here is the story of Francis and Albert Hackett. They wrote the Thin Man series, and um, they adapted the Diary of Anne Frank into a play and then into the movie uh, in, the 19, in the 1960s, early 60s. And uh, a friend of mine is now doing a book on how stories of the Holocaust have been presented on stage, and she called me and said, could you write me something about the Hackett's and doing the movie? And I went, of course I can't, because <laughs> no, most people don't recognize the screenwriters. It's sort of been my advocacy now to say, I don't care who directed the thing, that's just where they put the camera. I care who wrote what they say, because that's what people remember. So it was great to be able to do this. And then another friend of mine is uh, someone I met at a conference, uh, emailed me and said, I'm doing a series of books on um, famous TV writers. Hello, so you call Roseanne and say, what can she say about TV writers? Her first book is on Shonda Rhimes. And I looked at Shonda's work and I said, you know what, I'm tired of people saying that she's just a feminist, as if that's something to dismiss her. I think that her characters are humanists. And then I discovered she actually hired a humanist doctor to be the consultant on the shows for that exact, I didn't know that. I just figured from watching it, that's what I came away with. And so I ended up doing a chapter on looking at the characters from a humanist standpoint, which was fun. So, um, all right, so my final tip before we move on. I think I did 15 minutes, right? Uh, fast. Um, when you're in charge, you have to make sure you pay attention to everything because it's your book, right? When I first did this book, they wanted a cover of a woman diving. I said, it's a book about aviation. I said, yeah, but she's diving into the future. I said, yeah, she's half naked is what you're doing here. I'm not doing that shit. So they gave me Amelia and Sally, right? I, like, I could have said, okay, whatever, you people are experts. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, when I was doing this book, uh, they found this picture why is one not like the other? <laughs> the person looking for the proper picture didn't know who they were, right? And gave me three guys. At one point in their history, they, one guy, Peter Tork, had quit. I said, you can't put that on the front cover. I gotta have all four of them. Like, I'm the expert, I know this. Please find a picture, you know, and it's the same picture. They just found one version of it without him. So, of course, I had to fight about that. For this book, they were like, oh, this is a great picture. I was like, that doesn't say writer to me, right? And this says director to me. So I had to go until we got to a woman with a script. Right? So you have to make sure you're in charge. Um, for this book, when they first gave it to us, again, someone else had worked on it. They had Ben and they had Tom and they had the space shuttle, which I will teasingly tell you what my, my partner says the space shuttle is visual of. Y'all can just nod your head and know what I'm talking about. She's like, I'm not having that on the front of my book. And they wouldn't let us change it because they already paid for the pictures. And then we won those two friggin' awards on the first encyclopedia, and we went back and said, by the way, that cover, we need to get rid of it and put a girl in it. And so they found Margaret Mitchell doing astronomy. And then when it came to these stories, um, we knew Civil War was going to be a bunch of dudes in, in uniforms. And I said, no, we have to have a woman on the cover. I don't know how you do it, but there's got to be a woman. Of course, Mary Todd Lincoln. 
right? They went because we made them do it. We had to be in charge, right? And likewise, we said, now we need to have people of color in this thing. It can't just be white women on the front cover. Of course, they went to hidden figures, right? So you have to know what you're asking for. You have to advocate for your own work. So why should you do this? They're not going to pay you a ton of money. <laughs> I'm not going to retire on this. But every one of these books makes kids who go to the libraries agree with me. <laughs> and that's power. And I like that. So that's my section. Yay. Yay. All right. So the first one of my first experiences publishing was uh, submitting essays for her encyclopedia. And it, it's just been a very interesting process. And we've been um, good friends for however long it's been. We're not going to say. Um, so, oh, but where are we? So when I was thinking about this um, talk, I started remembering some of my grad school experiences. And one of the best assignments I ever got was an assignment to write down my teaching philosophy. It was right at the end of my master's degree. And here I ended up going and teaching community college, so I used it. Um, but I started thinking about, okay, so how do you create a historical narrative in the classroom? There's very limited time and space. How do you connect with students? What do I want them to get out of this? And it was the first time that I could be the teacher. So, and so we all have to decide why we do what we do. Whether it's teaching or writing, whether it's going to be English or history um, or film studies or, or whatever your area is. And so I sat down and thought about that. And really for me, it's about connecting with other people's stories, it's hearing, hearing about their successes and their struggles. What are the common threads of humanity and how does it inform my own experience? How can I discover? what it was like then. And the, my first chance to kind of have an eye-opening discovery was as an undergrad, I was reading a journal that was assigned to me. It was a 19th century journal from a young woman. She was like 19 years old in rural Utah, Price, Utah, this little teeny town in 1876. And I started reading it and she was worried about the same thing me and my roommates were talking about. She missed her boyfriend. She's like, how am I going to go to school? How am I going to pay for it? And who's coming to the dance on Saturday night? And it was that moment where I'm like, she's not that different from me. Even though she lived in the past, there is something common here. And I, want, and I became a historian so I could help other people discover, make those kinds of discoveries. So, but... How do we do it? I mean, first of all, you need to write with your audience in mind. Your audience is going to be different. If you're writing a dissertation, your audience is your committee. Straight up. Um, if you're doing a journal article, you're writing for other scholars in your field. If you're writing for students, then you've got a lot more options. And Roseanne has talked a lot about those. Um, so now, a few years ago, um, Wendy asked me to review a book. Mm -hmm. And it was called No Straight Path. So I started thinking about that. The, it's a uh, collection of autobiographical essays about women's experiences in the academy. And we're all going to walk our own paths. It may not look like anybody else's, but it's going to be yours. And you get to create it the way you want it to be and make your life the way it works for you. But I'm hoping that some of our stories and some of our experiences will help you as you work on your own path. So um, as Roseanne mentioned, um, a lot of times publishing opportunities come through your professional networks. So you have to build those networks and create them. And honestly, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing. So because there's always going to be time pressures, there's always going to be an obstacle. And it's easy to get distracted, especially when, as academics, you're supposed to do 50 different things at the same time. <laughs> so um, you have to know why you're doing it. And when I thought about this, I'm like, so why write or, excuse me, edit a collection of primary documents? So this came out of a networking experience. Um, I had written 
news or encyclopedia articles with Roseanne. And so I was already in the system at ABC Clio. Another alum, Marion Perales, worked there. She was editing their Voice of an Era series. And she said, do you want to write, the, do you want to do a book project with us? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I answered yes. Now I've been working on my uh, research on Catholic nuns for a long time. And this gave me an opportunity to do something different and to really reconnect with the larger narrative of U.S. women's history. So the book covers um, the second half of U.S. women's history. So it's late 19th century um, to as close to the present as I could get. Um, but you have to figure out why, why you want to do it, how, if it's going to match your interests, and if it's going to be worth the time you spend. Now, if you're going to measure it by money, I'm sorry, you, you can't. <laughs> so uh, so we're going to be straight up with that, okay? But, there is, but if it's something you want to do, um, then go for it. And I really wanted to be able to shape the narrative, put in stories that otherwise people wouldn't see. So, and we all have our own spin on why we do things. So the goal of this book is to capture the diversity of voices of uh, American women. Well, uh, American women. It's rarely, woman has not been a unifying category. I think we all know that. Um, race shapes black, Latinx, and Asian women's lives just as political ideology, culture, class, religion, or sexual identity influences others. You know, there is no just one woman. And I really believe that intersectionality matters because women experience um, multiple identities and they shift between them. Sometimes several times in a day. Okay? So like you, you could have Jane. It's not just a woman. She could be an Afro-Cuban immigrant, a Catholic parishioner, um, a PTA president, a nurse, and a mother of two. And she's code switching all day, okay? But so I think it's important to try and capture that reality um, because it ref better reflects the lives of the women we're studying. You can't pigeonhole someone. And so there are multiple identities. And so I really wanted to try and bring that out. So back to that first teaching assignment, okay, writing my teaching philosophy. I called it teaching the intersections. So we all have limited time, whether you're teaching a course or putting in a text, you have to choose what to put in it and what to focus on, right? And so I looked for moments of confluence where you could access race, class, gender, religion, immigration status, any of those multiple identities where you could access them well, at least one at, a, at least one or two, uh, if not all of them at the same time. So I found this document on the National Archives Docs Teach website. Now this is during the exclusion era. Um, Lu Bao Kong and his wife Wang Shi were stopped at the border crossing, the U.S. border crossing in El Paso. Okay, so um, the immigration agent questioned their marriage. So um, now this is the exclusion era. There was a lot of worry about whether or not um, Chinese women were being brought to San Francisco as prostitutes. And Lu Bao Kong and Wang Shi married in Mexico. So they didn't, they, so they were, the immigration agent was interviewing them, asking them all these questions. So why didn't you marry in China? Well, it didn't work. He was trying to catch them to see whether or not their marriage was legit. Um, but this gives students a chance to look at the things at the time period. It looks at immigration, it looks at ethnicity, and it looks at gendered exclusion all at the same time. So that's an example of something that I wanted to put in this book and how, and so I thought about all of those things when putting the book together. Now, any book about women's history is going to talk about work, community activism, and fight for equal rights. Straight up, those are important. Don't leave them out. 
<laughs> um, so, but I really wanted to try and enrich the narrative a little bit and look at things from multiple perspectives. So whether it was woman suffrage or the ERA or even women in the KKK, I wanted to be able to have the, the reader, and the, or in this case the student, be able to see it from both sides. So I put in an article, uh, or yeah, an article from the National Association opposed to women's suffrage, mm -hmm. as well as Alice Stone Blackwell's pamphlet that presents both sides. It's also important to me to put in women's private lives. I think that matters. Um, so there's a selection of documents that talk about women as caregivers, both as parents, as well as caregivers of older adults. That's something that often gets missed, older women. And so there are several documents about older women here. Um, changing conceptions of marriage over the last 150 years. Consumer culture, as well as confronting violence. Now, uh, when you're looking at many women's history textbooks, um, there's not a lot of time. Instructors often run out of time to get to the 21st century. <laughs> you know, there's only 18 weeks, and in some places, 15, right? Or so, 10. oh, or 10. Or 10. <laughs> yeah, so then you want two quarters, <laughs> but you don't always get it. Um, so, but one thing I did in this book is because it's going to last a long time, I hope, <laughs> um, I wanted to get as close to the present as I could. And um, so students have a chance to engage in their own history. And so I've got, uh, I've got a mother's experience during the pandemic in a congressional testimony. We have immigrant detention, family detention centers, and the history of that. Um, missing and murdered uh, Native American women. So we can get at many of these different voices and the silences as much as we can. Now, it's the selection process, time and money, yours and your editors is gonna constrain any project, right? So you have to think about how you're spending your time and how you're using your budget. Your time, depending on what your other commitments are, is yours. So you, so you're not, but it's, there's the opportunity cost of what you're not doing while you're doing this. Um, but one thing to think about when you're looking at especially primary documents, whether you're going to publish them in a dissertation or you want to do um, oh, a blog that analyzes a primary document, whatever you want to do, you have to think about copyright. And um, documents published after 1923 are most often in, are, are, are not in the public domain. Okay? So you have to get permission for anything after 1923. Um, now sometimes copyright holders will let you use it for free for educational purposes. Other times they don't. <laughs> so, but this book is the second half of US history. So almost all of it is going to be under copyright. So I had to get really creative on how to figure out, okay, so what can I put in this book? The publisher only had $1,500. I have 112 documents. So how are we going to make this work, right? So I had to get creative. U.S. Um, documents, uh, documents produced by the U.S. government are in the public domain. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can use court cases and um, congressional testimony. The mother's experience during the pandemic came straight out of the congressional testimony. And so those are great places for primary sources. Other documents that are created by U.S. government agencies. I've got um, some old posters, some Cold War posters. And that was published by the U.S. government, so I could put it in. It was so nice. <laughs> so you have, there are other things that you have to think about in the publishing process as well. But how many court cases can you read? <laughs> no. You can only do a few of those, right, before your eyes kind of glaze over. So I was really grateful that the publisher was able to pay for some. 
but you have to track down the copyright holder. Luckily, your editor does this. <laughs> and you don't have to do it yourself um, because they have the expertise and know how to get it. Um, but I did have to drop a few. Like, I really wanted to put in um, something from the Jane Collective during, uh, in Chicago during the 1970s that talked about abortion activism. They never responded after months and months. So we couldn't do it. And so I, was, I felt bad about dropping that, but what are you going to do? So, so that's the, the trade-offs. Um, but I really like to be able to create this narrative. Now, because it's a text, it's designed as a text, I wanted it to be both student and instructor friendly. So one of my goals was to help students contextualize the documents and make connections across time periods, as well as give them tips on making their own historical discoveries. So each one of these documents, it has an introduction, it has context clues, it has the aftermath of the event that the document represents, it has discussion questions that could be assignments, um, it also has other short research activities that students could do. You know, this particular one is ask students to analyze the World War II poster collection at Northwestern University Library. And each one of the documents talks about, has something where you could um, jump off from it. You can either study an oral history or one assignment is to do your own, do an oral history or do a photo, uh, PowerPoint presentation with suffrage era posters or, and photographs. Um, if this instructor wants uh, students to practice writing, there are essay prompts right in there. And there are essay prompts that cover multiple time periods. So if you're writing a test, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so it makes it easy. So um, I wanted it to be able to do both. Now, I've had a lot of other pu publishing opportunities, and Roseanne's done a great job talking about the overall landscape. My primary research is the history of the Daughters of Charity in California, and these Catholic sisters have been fighting poverty in California for um, 170 years. Okay. So my first book is um, Daughters of Charity uh, that um, Joanna mentioned, and that grew out of my dissertation. So it's the history of St. Vincent's Hospital and the daughter's influence on the hospital industry in Los Angeles. So I've also published a couple of journal articles out of that work, as well as my current project. Um, participated in some edited collections, which have been really helpful. Um, one thing, if you ever get a chance when you're in the dissertation research phase um, or to participate in a research seminar that'll have a publication come out of it, do it. I participated in one last summer. Um, it's a religion in the West and it brought in scholars from all different perspectives. And so it was really good because we got to read each other's work, get feedback, got feedback from multiple people and made a, a much better essay and a much better project, product. So that's going to come out from uh, University of Nebraska Press next year. So I'm excited about that. Um, I don't do a lot of publishing online, but um, some people, you can look at journals uh, some scholarly organizations, some publishers, they often have blogs which are a little more accessible to early career scholars. Um, some people even do their research on TikTok and YouTube. And um, it just depends how you want to engage in, with the world and what your skills are, what your interests are, and who your audience is and where they're at. Because you have to find a way for that to get the word out. There are thousands and thousands of books published every year. And so that's um, part of the challenge. One of the good things about working with Bloomsbury is they're an international press. Um, they're a very large press. They actually had a budget for permissions. Um, they have a marketing department. <laughs> um, I was very happy when the marketing uh, agent told me, I just sent your book out to our email list of 50,000 people. I was like, oh, 
thank you. <laughs> you know, so now the downside of going with a big publishing house is editors have multiple projects. Um, your book may get lost in the catalog. So you'll have to weigh the pluses and minuses of any relationship, of any relationship with editors. So um, I just wanted to give kind of a few tips that are helpful on anyone's scholarly journey. One thing that's most important is hone your craft. Learn to write and edit well. <laughs> So if you can learn to write fast, like Roseanne, that's even better. So I'm not fast, um, but that's all right. So take advantage of whatever writing opportunities there are. Share your drafts, read other people's drafts. You learn how to write better by reading other people's. Um, and you can see what's wrong in somebody else's a lot easier than you can see what's wrong in yours. But you have to be humble, right? <laughs> and be willing to take the, the advice. So if there's a writing retreat, go. Um, online or offline. So also operate from a place of abundance. Okay. You know, we live in a world of scarcity. Um, there's a lot of budget tightening everywhere. Do doesn't matter where you are. Um, don't matter if you're in the corporate world or in academia or whatever. But think about operating from a place of abundance. Okay? There will be a way to do what you need to do. So be courteous. Be generous. Volunteer if you've got the bandwidth for it. Um, so... And if you hear about an opportunity and it's not good for you, tell somebody else. Recommend somebody else. You never know when somebody else will do, the, do you the same favor. Okay? And also, work on building a platform and a community. Okay? So um, find scholars that you admire and learn how they engage with the communities that they care about. Okay? So if, you, if there's somebody on... Do I dare say Twitter? Um, <laughs> okay, so if there's a scholar on Twitter or X or Mastodon or whichever blue sky, whichever one we're using these days, um, then follow them. See what they post. See how they post about it. See how they connect with people. If there's somebody who does book reviews on TikTok, academic book reviews. I haven't found one yet, but I don't do TikTok, so I don't look. Um, but then follow and figure out how they're engaging with their audience. Try and make friends inside and outside of your institution. This can be done through writing groups or conferences. Um, so if do you, when you go do your research, meet people, talk to people. For introverts, it's really scary. <laughs> um, but it's worth it. So one thing to make that easier is to participate in causes that matter to you. So if you're interested in um, fighting domestic violence, volunteer. If you want to work at a food pantry and fight poverty, meet people there. Um, uh, go volunteer at a local um, archive or participate in somebody's oral history project. Um, that can build those relationships, which will help you have a community. So, and honestly, and it's the, your community that's going to see you through. Um, because we all need support, whether it's financial support or emotional support, or just, I can't handle this anymore, let me talk to you. Um, <laughs> you know, and Rosanna and I were able to do that many times, and I, and I really appreciated that. So... But um, here are a few resources that I have found helpful just in the last few months. Um, if you're interested in writing history, and I'm sure there are others um, for the other disciplines, I really like Kate Carpenter's Drafting the Past podcast. Um, Jennifer Van Alstyne has a website which teaches scholars how to build an online presence. 
She has courses if you want tips on building a website or how to work with social media as a scholar. Um, if you get to the point where, not if, yeah. I'm not saying if, yes. no. <laughs> when you get to the point of your book proposal, okay, um, read the book proposal book. Okay, it's a guide for scholarly authors. It's actually quite, it would actually be very useful in um, putting together a dissertation proposal or a, a master's thesis proposal. You know, it's because you have to find um, competitive titles um, and think about audience. And that's something we don't always do when we're writing in school. So uh, thinking about audience. All right. So if you want to come check out the book, yes. please do. Um, if you would like an electronic copy, I have um, an interest sheet. I'll arrange for you to get an electronic copy. If you have friends who are teaching, um, pass it along. Um, anything we can do to get the word out is wonderful. So. All right. Yes. Okay.